Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm going to tell you about something that I'm really very excited about. It's something that I've been thinking about for years, and I finally said to myself, it's time to publish a paper. So this paper that we're going to talk about today was published in Briefings in Bioinformatics, as Dr. Riva mentioned. It's called the Hollow Strengths of List Family Languages Facilitate Building Complex and Flexible Bioinformatics Applications. We co-authored that paper with Eddie Weitz, with Peter Karp, and my PI Klaus Walta. And this talk has been put together by myself and by Jeff Schrager at uh, Stanford University. So this is the paper, and this just recently came out uh, late last year. And it's, it's, it's a very interesting piece for people that come to bioinformatics from the perspective of Python, R, and Bash, and maybe C. It's, it's like a breath of fresh air, I think, in that sense. And that's kind of the spirit with which I wanted to design this talk. Namely, I don't want to simply rehash what is in the paper. I want to make this talk separate from the paper, but still along some central themes. In other words, you guys are all in for a treat today. And I really hope that you enjoy this talk. And if you like it enough, perhaps you will go online and take a look at this paper. It is open source, and it's free. So with that being said, when I was thinking about how to construct a talk and along which themes I wanted to, to design it, well, I went to the source itself. I went to Eddie, and I said, what should I make the talk about? And he told me, you know, Hi, Bogdan. ELS attendees will usually know Lisp very well and like it, so praising Lisp would be preaching to the choir. Okay. <laughs> if I were in the audience, I'd be interested in learning about real-world Lisp usage in bioinformatics. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And instead of, you know, like Eddie was saying, praising Lisp, as we all know the benefits and and very nice things about this. We're going to focus on biology. We're going to focus this talk on a couple of central themes. Namely, the two underlying themes of this talk will be, number one, how list can actually save, and you will, you will see by the end of this talk what I mean by the, world, or by the word save, save the biological world thanks to symbolic computing, and how the community needs to rethink their computational approach to biology in general as we move forward in science specifically in the field of bioinformatics, in the field of computational biology, and all these things. So with that, I'd like to begin the talk with a little simulation demonstration. I'm going to simulate what the concluding slide of a biology talk usually looks like. The concluding slide. <laughs> yeah. Usually a biology talk would consist of a huge amount of complex, perhaps boring data, depends on the audience, and it would end something like this. So, in conclusion, we think that this model sums up our findings. Homologous desensitization of GPCRs results from the binding of beta arrestins to agonists occupied receptors following phosphorylation of the receptors by GRKs. Beta arrestin binding sterically precludes coupling between the receptor and heterotrimeric G proteins, leading to termination of signaling by G protein effectors. Receptor-bound beta arrestins also act as adapter proteins, binding to components of the clathrin endocytic machinery, including clathrin, beta-2 adaptin, and receptor sequestration reflects a dynamin-dependent endocytosis or GPCRs via clathrin-coated pits. Once internalized, GPCRs exhibit two distinct patterns of beta arrestin interaction. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> There will be a quiz in about 15 minutes. <laughs> so on the topic at hand, how LISP will save the world. So the last 50 years of the last century, approximately since the discovery of DNA, was the golden age of biological data, where high throughput technologies such as genome sequencing and microarrays created biological data at a rate completely unimaginable to the scientists working before the 1950s and the 1960s. And an enormous amount of data was indeed collected. There are approximately 23,000 sequenced genomes in the NCBI database. Depicted here is the number of sequences deposited in that database, 
which is over 50 billion sequences at this point. 50 billion. You can see that we're in what a microbial biologist would call a log phase, where the organism is, is growing essentially, let's say, uh, exponentially. So it will eventually, probably in the next 50 years, level off after all the relevant organisms have been sequenced. But there are other types of data that we are only beginning to gather that haven't even entered log phase, especially imagery of all sorts. Microscopy, spectroscopy, flow cytometry, microarray data, and many more huge data sources with arcane formats. But if the last century was the golden age of biological data, then this century is certain to be the golden age of biological knowledge. Knowledge. When I recently checked, there were 27 million abstracts in the PubMed database. 27 million abstracts. That's tens of millions of published papers, presentations, and abstracts. Whereas the number of sequences will probably level off sometime soon, the amount of additional data is about to launch, and the analyses and interpretation of all that data is sure to produce papers at an absolutely alarming rate for probably centuries to come. For fun, I entered a search for a rather obscure organism called cyanobacteria into the main NCBI search page. Cyanobacteria are blue-green algae, basically ocean scum. There are 42 sequenced genomes, 1,000 3D domains, that's protein folding solutions, and almost 9,000 papers just on ocean scum. Here are some electron microscope pictures of one particular cyanobacteria called Prochlorococcus. Note that it's less than a micron in diameter. 9,000 papers on ocean scum that's less than a micron in diameter. Anyway, although all of these papers have data, their conclusions constitute knowledge. And that knowledge comes usually in the form of models. That is, partial hypotheses about what's going on in biological systems, very often inside single cells, like the one that I started off this talk with. A model is just a formal representation that can be used, usually by computer, to simulate the system under study, or to analyze it in various other ways, for example, forming explanations. My central claim is that in order to keep up with this flood of knowledge, biologists must become accustomed to using computational tools for thought. Tools to build and analyze models of this sort. There is a tradition in engineering of developing and analyzing formal models, most often represented by systems of equations whose parameters are fitted to data. The analysis of such models, including the parameter fitting, is done through tools such as MATLAB. This is an example that you're seeing currently up in front of you of a differential equation model of yeast bud development due to Chen et al. This one happens to be expressed in terms of about 15 differential equations. And for what it's worth, here's its dynamics when you run it through a simulator. These models were created by hand over a period of nearly a decade, and the parameters were tuned by hand. How does it match up with the actual yeast cell cycle measurements? Well, it has a certain qualitative similarity. Qualitative similarity. Complex models of biological systems like the one I started with and this one are being created much faster and are much more complex than biologists can possibly reason about them, which isn't very well, not very quickly. The Chen et al. model that you saw on the last slide, by the way, looks complex, but the abstract qualitative model, the equivalent of the model I started out with, only involves a few key players. You can find hundreds of abstract models like this by just browsing the biological literature. And of course, there are specialized databases full of them. If the model is written as a set of parameterized differential equations, then simulation is relatively easy, as simulators for differential equations are a pretty well understood technology these days. And the BioSpice project is trying to create a biology-specific tool set for just this purpose. BioSpice gets its name from SPICE, a well-known electrical engineering simulation tool. Some of you may have heard of it. 
The idea of biospice is to apply the same concepts to biological systems. Biospice is a large project with many simulation and analysis tools. But, and here is the key, most of these are designed to work with primarily quantitative models, mostly differential equation models. Now, that might be a problem because unfortunately this quantitative modeling approach fails short in biology for at least three reasons. First of all, biological data is incredibly expensive, so there isn't nearly enough clean data. To fit the many parameters of the thousands of equations that are likely to be required to describe even a single organism. Second, biological systems are not like engineered systems. Engineered systems are engineered to operate robustly under certain constrained conditions, and those conditions can be specified, and the model analyzed under those conditions. We know, for example, that a bridge has to stand up to having cars going over it, not both that and fly at 700 miles an hour at 40,000 feet carrying 300 people. So you can write down one set of equations for a bridge and one set of equations for a bridge and another for an airplane. And they remain separate because the devices are separate. A single model doesn't have to do both. But biological systems un un operate under many different conditions, sometimes very differently. For example, we have a lag phase and a log phase, and a log phase under various conditions. And our metabolism is in a slightly different phase during those states. Moreover, for multicellular organisms, you have different regulatory logic in different tissues. So biological models must have some sort of state logic which requires either using nonlinear models or some sort of binary logic, neither of which fits well with the classical numerical modeling paradigms. The last and most important of the three reasons that traditional equation-based engineering models aren't appropriate for biological systems is that they fail to offer the sort of expressive and analytical richness that biologists would like to get regarding those systems. Biologists want to understand the internal details of how the system works, not just its I.O. behavior. They want to know how the system works at the level of the biochemical machine. That is, what all the proteins and nucleic acids and small molecules do, and how they interact to make the cell function. Now, one might well say, oh, you want a model of the chemistry? Well, we know how to do that. Chemical reactions are simple to express in terms of differential equations. And then we'd be back to biospice. But unfortunately, it's not that simple. First off, yes, reaction dynamics are easy to express in differential equation terms, but hard to parameterize. And I remember my first complaint that there isn't enough data to parameterize them. Second, again, the system is very, very complex. So complex, in fact, that some serious biologists think cellular systems are proof of God. <laughs> I kid you not, this is a significant aspect of the theory called intelligent design, whose proponents argue that cellular complexity is so great that it could not have evolved naturally. So, very complex stuff. Regardless, we really only know how to express the sorts of chemical equations that we understand, ones between simple molecules neglecting conformational information and other factors, but all those things come into play in cell biology. Finally, and here's the kicker, biologists don't actually want an explanation in biochemical terms of things that they don't think of as biochemical. Instead, they want an explanation on their own terms, in the terms that match the way that they think about the system, and in terms that will help them do the sorts of analyses that are relevant to them. And this is very rarely in terms of biochemical reactions. Well, so what terms do they think in them? The answer is, most generally, in sort of machine-like terms that involve, at the lowest level, parts, processes, dynamics, and operating logic. 
how you get those states I was talking about into. Some of these processes and dynamics are simple biochemistry, but mo most of them are not. Take how DNA is transcribed to RNA, and then RNA translated into proteins, so-called gene expression. No one talks about gene expression in biochemical terms, really. Well, someone might. Transcriptome biochemists, for instance, but not cell biologists for the most part. They, of course, know that it's a biochemical process, but that's like a psychologist knowing that the brain is made of neurons. It's the wrong level of description. Instead, biologists talk about DNA replication in terms of the polymerase factory, which is a huge gathering of proteins hooking onto the DNA and separating the strands and pulling the DNA through the factory and creating the RNA, and then the RNA being edited and transported out of the nucleus and becoming attached to a ribosome. And the ribosome reading it produces, produces the protein, and so on and so forth. Now, all of which brings me back to beta arrestants. Okay, quiz time. The second time, through looking for you know, the, the parts, the processes, the dynamics, and the operating logic, and this is straight off the figure caption for, for that diagram, contributed by uh, Kosi Gramatikov, PhD to Bioparta. So Bioparta is one of the big um, applications developed in, in, in LISP that's very, very popular in bioinformatics. And as we saw at the beginning of this, of this talk, simulating the concluding slide of a biology talk, it's sometimes very complex and sometimes very boring, and so on and so forth, you get the idea. Now I'd like to see you put that into your differential equation simulator and run it. It's very, very difficult. In fact, like I was saying, some people think of it as proof of God. Now, Bioparta. Bioparta has over 400 models, just like this one. Some of them are more complex. Here are a few others. Eukaryotic protein translation, action of PPRA, EPRDD and EPRAG, and effects on gene expression, granzyme A mediated apoptosis pathway multi-step regulation of transcription by PTI-TX2, cell cycle, G2M checkpoint. This one's in standard biology classes, but this is a, a pretty detailed slide that I thought I would just throw up there to give you, give you an idea. P53 signaling pathway, very popular with cancer. Double-stranded RNA-induced gene expression. And of course, the biospice diagram that we looked at earlier, and let's not forget photosynthesis and light reactions. So, of course, these are just pictures. We don't yet have a good way to represent and reason about models of this sort. And this is why LISP will be able to save the world. But I'm somewhat ahead of myself. Now you might say, that these people are simply crazy, that they shouldn't be talking about it like this. It's really just a set of chemical reactions, and you should just describe it in those terms and be done with it. And you'd be right in a certain sense, and wrong in any sense that matters, unfortunately. A cell really is more like a machine than it is like a bag of chemical reactions. Even if the machine appears to be made of chemicals, and everything in it happens by chemistry, well, a computer is made of atoms, and everything in it is just physics. But thinking of a program in terms of the physics of the computer isn't usually a good way to think of complex computer programs, nor even of computers themselves. Although maybe someday it will be if we have quantum programming languages, quantum computers. We're getting there eventually, hopefully. I'll be the first to buy one. <laughs> so biologists want to model cells like machines in terms of processes that take place within them, and how things move around within them, and that's like diffusion, all that sort of thing. The only problem is they didn't build the machine. They don't have the blueprints. They don't have the blueprints of the cell. So we don't know what the parts, processes, dynamics, and operating logics are within the cell. So what we have to basically do every time is we have to reverse engineer the cell. Biology if you want to define it, is essentially a giant reverse engineering project. 
So biologists are trying to do something that most engineers don't need to do, which is to create models like the ones we've seen here so far. Now if the model were a set of few simple differential equations, like the Chen model, all we'd have to do is figure them out, and then their parameters to a massive amount of data to fit them, and we'd be done. That might take a few decades, or with BioSpice, maybe a few months. Unfortunately, as I've tried to argue, biological systems aren't easy to describe in terms of simple equations, and there aren't just a few of them, and we have nearly no data with which to parameterize them. Once again, unfortunately. And this is one reason why LISP will save the world, because it's clear that the creation of biological models is a symbolic computing task of enormous proportions. It's a symbolic computing task for three reasons. First, as I've just begun arguing, the models, as biologists would like to see them, are composed of complex processes, dynamics and logic, which aren't easily captured in terms of sets of differential equations. Of course, I'm not saying that biological models shouldn't be formally, shouldn't be formal mathematical equations, as we all know. They, you know, it's not like they shouldn't be formal, but mathematical equations are symbolic as well, and algebra is the purest of symbol manipulation. But differential equations are fairly simplistic symbolic representations as compared with a description of what some subsystem of a complex machine is doing. Also, such equations usually range over real value spaces. And this is the second sense in which biocomputing of this sort is symbolic. Although the end space of reals has many useful properties, it has one really ugly one, which is that it's infinite and continuous. So you have to give your equations parameters, or ranges of parameters, in that infinite continuous space. If you could do this, great. One of the most amazing things to me is Planck's constant. Physics isn't just a qualitative theory, it's exactly 6.62, 6068 times 10 to the negative 34 square meters times kilogram of seconds, give or take a few millionths of a percent. And that's great, and everyone is striving for that kind of precision, but there's just no possibility of having such a level of precision in biology, in the, even if we were willing to accept numerically ranged equations. There's not nearly enough data to be able to fit that many equations. It's like biologists are trying to solve an n-body problem where n is a million or two. Imagine that. Take a single organism. Say our friend, Procolorococcus. This is one of the simplest organisms on Earth. Remember, under a micro, and it has only about 1,700 genes, each one of which produces a single protein for comparison, you have about 30,000 genes or so, 20, 24, 25. And we know that most of them produce more than one protein, maybe tens or hundreds of them, each depending upon the operating logic. Most of pro Prochlorococcus' 1,700 proteins are enzymes, that is, they catalyze chemical reactions of some sort. Now, we don't know exactly what exact reaction most of them drive, but let's just say we did, for sake of argument. Let's say that we set up 1,700 equations, and let's also ignore the operating logic, so all of those reactions slash equations are operating all the time. So all we need to do in order to get a model of the system in these terms is to parameterize those 1,700 equations. Just a simple matter of equation fitting, really. You simply measure the dynamics of all of those few thousand internal terms over a period of, say, a few cell cycles, maybe a week or so, at millisecond time scale, do that maybe 10 times, dump it all into an equation fitter, and you're done. <coughs> oh, wait a minute. What do you mean measure the dynamics of the internal terms at millisecond time scale? You mean measure all the concentrations of all the small molecules? Um, let's see. Do we know how to measure the concentrations of any of the small molecules in a running cellular system or measure pretty much anything? And of course, it's not just their concentrations which, you have to, which have to be in fair precision. It's also, in many cases, their oxidation state. Oh, and where they are in the cell. Oh, and in many cases, also their shapes. And none of this can be measured with present-day technology, except in very qualitative terms. Not quantitative terms, qualitative terms. 
A decade ago, one of the 10 new hot emerging technologies was metabolomics, which tries to do just this. But it's a field that pretty much to this day is still in its infancy. It's still only, only up and coming. And anyway, one of the other 10 hot new emerging technologies about a decade ago was putting wireless networks into airplanes that you can surf the web. Now, we've been surfing the web on airplanes for quite a while now. I mean, as long as you pay, obviously. Um, but it, it was a much simpler problem to solve, at least compared to metabolomics. So you see, those were the 10 new hot emerging technologies a decade ago. Metabolomics is still in its infancy, wireless networks on the planes. We've obviously solved a much simpler problem. And this is the second reason why LISP, or more precisely symbolic computing, will save the world. Is that the range of the process models, the equations, is not, cannot possibly be purely real value. It has to combine continuous and discrete ranges, and more specifically, non-numerical. It has to be both qualitative and quantitative. The range of those complex process equations that must compose biological models is, to a very great degree, symbolic. That is, much of the model is more like a logic than it is like a numerical computation. As a result, we need to have both. qualitative and quantitative components in the models that we build. Indeed, this is not just for the practical reason that I just gave, but also for theoretical reasons. It has Boolean switches. Indeed, they aren't just Boolean, they are n-ary, and n can be mm, pretty big, possibly thousands in some cases. Cellular components signal one another by making conformational changes to one another. They attach little molecular gizmos onto one another, which then causes the carrier molecule to be recognized, or not, by detectors, which might then detach the signal, and you can build incredibly complex counters and all manner of insanely intricate machinery this way. It's a machine, and the description <coughs> needs to be of a machine in qualitative terms. And describing machines in qualitative terms is a symbolic computing problem that we've been working away in the field of artificial intelligence for some 40 or 50 years. So, I've argued that biological models are fundamentally complex, combined qualitative and quantitative process models, and that symbolic computing is necessarily going to be involved in their simulation. But I now want to talk a little bit more about the building of the models themselves, even beyond their simulation. Just a few minutes ago, I made a couple of important assumptions. Remember Prochorococcus? I said that we were going to assume that we know what those 1700 genes do so that we can set up their equations. But we don't know what all the genes do, unfortunately. So not only do we think that we know what they do, but unfortunately we only know about a third of the 1700 genes of this bacteria that they do, but we're not even sure about those. We're not even sure about the third. Because like all science, biology is fundamentally collaborative. You're collaborating even if you don't know your collab who your collaborators are, because biologists base their theories about what something does upon what other biologists think some other things that look similar do. <laughs> do you guys see the problem with that reasoning? This isn't always true. There are other very difficult ways to figure out what a gene does. That is, what the proteins that it creates do. But it's usually simpler to just say, oh, well, my gene or its product looks like your gene or its product. And yours is a calcium channel, so maybe mine is a calcium channel too. Now, notice that although this is very convenient, it's also problematic for three reasons. First, genes never are really exact matches to other genes. Maybe they are about 70% alike. That's pretty good. So if my gene is 70% the same as yours, and yours produces a calcium channel, can we assume that they both produce calcium channels? Who knows? Who knows? How many small conformational changes would it take to turn a calcium channel into a potassium channel, let's say? No one really knows that much either. So, second, let's say that they were 100% alike. Okay, well, 
but maybe in the presence of other, some other you know, things going on that we don't really know about, this channel actually delivers potassium because there's some other small molecule that in the context of the real running system locks itself onto this gene product or even onto the gene itself and changes its conformation. Who knows, that sort of thing happens all the time in biology. Conformational changes. Now, biologists are aware of, although don't, I think, appreciate the importance of those two problems, but there is a third insidious difficulty with saying, and I'll say it again, biologists base their theories about what something does upon what other biologists think some other things that look similar do. Now, the problem is, what if the theory you were using to draw your conclusions was wrong? You know, I've actually seen at least one field in biology go completely awry because back in the early 2000s, some people published some critical papers in high-impact journals, like we're talking some of the highest-impact journals in our field. And those papers were cited about 300 times. And then seven, eight, maybe 10 years later, the field completely died. And you wonder why that field died, and you try to trace back the source, and you keep going back to the source, and keep going back to the source, and you notice, oh my, in the early 2000s someone published this, and you're like, wow, 300 citations. And that's how a field goes in the other direction. Now, like I was saying, so what if, what if the theory on which you're basing and you're drawing your conclusions was wrong? If that theory was wrong, you're going to be wrong, but even if someone figures out that the theory that you depended on was wrong, sometime after you used it, how are you going to figure out that it has been modified? <clears throat> so biology, as with most science, is a gigantic Bayesian influence network. Seriously, <laughs> a gigantic Bayesian influence network. But no one is keeping track of the links between the nodes, unfortunately. Most biological databases only record the current state of knowledge, not its provenance. This is, of course, true for pretty much every science, but for most other sciences, people who don't know what they're doing can't really play. <laughs> not everyone can build a cyclotron, but anyone can look into a microscope, and having a molecular lab isn't actually very far removed from that. You can get the DNA from strawberries using just a blender and alcohol. Now, there's peer review, of course, but God help us in the, in the web world. And anyway, the peer reviewer's knowledge is often unsupported, out of date, or simply wrong, just like the person who wrote the paper. I mean, who would know, right? So modern molecular biology is built entirely on a hill of sand, which wouldn't be so bad if we knew when a part of the hill had shifted up from underneath us. Now, all of this just sounds like a database problem. We have to know whose theories we based ours on and whose data or whatever else all sounds like simple provenance tracking. Sounds like what Oracle was built for. Why is that a symbolic computing problem? But let's think about what it takes to do this in light of the problems of biological models being complex qualitative process models. If everything were in simple equation form and all the base terms were known, you'd be able to tell what was what. Let's take genes, which are a good example of where this is pretty simple. Suppose that you and I are working on the same gene in the same organism. Okay, so we add our names to some central database somewhere, say at the NCBI, that puts together discoveries about that gene. That's simple, nothing complex in that. But now let's say that we're working, instead of on the same gene, rather on similar genes in different organisms. Okay, well, the database has to know which genes are similar to one another. That's not too hard. Although there are lots of organisms, and you have to have some metric for similar enough. But still, it's not a bad for artificial intelligence. I mean, quantifying similar enough in terms of biological systems. This is not exactly reverse AI. But now let's go one step further and say that we're working on similar systems within different organisms. So, okay, so for the database to automatically put us together, it has to have some sense of what constitutes a system. Maybe a pathway of chemical reactions. And you can compare my set of reactions to yours and figure that we should know about one another. But now, it's beginning to sound more like a knowledge base than a database. That's okay. We can sort of do knowledge bases of this level of complexity in Oracle. But if I go just one more little step, we're suddenly in nearly full-blown AI territory. I've argued that the models 
that biologists work with are complex sets of processes, not all, indeed mostly not biochemical reactions. But now we're in trouble because if we're still in the midst of reverse engineering, trying to work out how these things work, and there's no agreed upon terminology, then the metric of similarity could be quite complex. You say trafficked to an acidified endosomal compartment, and I say engulfed and hydrolyzed in an organelle. <laughs> We're trying to compare one functional description of a complex system with another. And that's not an easy task, especially because no one has a clear idea of what biological function means. Indeed, function is the most important problem in modern biology. What does a gene or some other biological component do is the question that occupies the attention of nearly every biologist every day of his or her career. The concept of theory in biology is essentially theorizing about what biological components do and how they do it, which amounts, in the end, to a recursive application of what subcomponents of the higher level presentation do. Unfortunately, function is both the most important and least well understood problem. Biological function is not a fixed thing. It is fundamentally contextual, and the given object can have an infinitude of various functions. There are some promising approaches to this problem. For example, there is a project called the Genontology, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, which is trying to list all the possible biological functions. They're slightly broken about the complexities of representation, but at least they have the idea that they need to have some sort of controlled vocabulary, which everybody appreciates. So my personal approach to this is a thing called view application. The idea here is that complex systems of any sort, mechanical, social, mathematical, are composed from complex combinations of views, or frames, or scripts, or schemas, or whatever you want to call them, and it is the compositional parts that express the content of the models, a different sort of controlled vocabulary. Incidentally, view application is an approach to two fundamental problems at once. I've been talking about the problem of functional analysis for comparing models with one another, but I've argued elsewhere that the same process of view composition is fundamental to building the models themselves. That is, not only are views composed to create new concepts of biological function, but biological models are composed to form new, more complex models. This is a whole other talk, and so I won't go further into it here, but if you're interested, I can, I can give you the citations later. Regardless of whose theory of function you buy, it should be clear that to the extent that you want a computer to help you with biological reasoning, it's going to be doing heavy use symbolic computing. It's very likely to be doing it in a sufficiently advanced language that amounts to an implementation of LISP. So it is essentially symbolic computing that will enable biologists to compose and reason about complex models <coughs> whose form of domain is essentially, at least in part, symbolic, and which must be matched in essentially symbolic terms to what amounts to essentially symbolic cast experimental results. It is essentially symbolic computing that will enable biologists who are working on similar problems to find one another and to compare their work and their results and to keep track of changes in the field. And composition of complex models is essentially symbolic computing. So symbolic computing conveniently abbreviated here as the L word is fundamental to biology. So let's say, just hypothetically, that I've convinced you that symbolic computing is the most important tool in computational biology in the coming century. And maybe you'll believe as a result that since biology is relevant to medicine, that therefore symbolic computing is similarly related to drug discovery and all of that. But save the world? I mean, how does this rise to the level of saving the world? Well, you remember, remember these little guys? So, Prochlorococcus, the humble little cyanobacteria that scientists work on in their labs, they have only 1,700 genes and are less than a micron in diameter. If we're ever going to have what amounts to a complete understanding of an organism, it's most likely that uh, it will be of an organism of this sort, probably not of human beings, at least not, in, not anytime soon. Now, ocean scum, this, more specifically, uh, well, not, 
the cell area picture on the next slide, ocean scum, there's, there's different kinds of ocean scum called phytoplankton. Plankton are things that float around in the ocean, and phytoplankton are photosynthetic beings that basically float around all year, all over the place, throughout the entire ocean ecosystem. Now, your number of friend here, Mr. Photosynthesis, it turns out that among processes, photosynthesis is by far the most important on Earth, as with any process. It has many functions, but among them are creating oxygen and sucking up carbon dioxide and the greenhouse gas. So we usually think of we usually think of the ocean as a big pool of water full of fish, but actually it's a rich stew of bacteria and viruses with an occasional rare multicellular organism. But nothing bigger than a single cell is truly environmentally important, and among the single cell organisms, Prochlorococcus is the most important of them all. In fact, Prochlorococcus is by far the most important organism on the planet. It creates over half of the oxygen that we breathe. It created nearly all the coal and oil on Earth that removes over half the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide mostly from the atmosphere, and it's the base of the marine food chain. One species of Prochlorococcus constitutes nearly half of the ocean biomass. These little guys aren't bloom or crash, you know, if they either do this or that. All the, all the drugs in the world aren't going to help you because there isn't going to be any oxygen to breathe. So that's what I mean by save the world. Um, understanding how Prochlorococcus responds to environmental change is it's one of the most important scientific problems, I think, of our time, even though I'm not, in, I'm not specifically in that field, but Jeff was saying, and uh, you know, I've been hearing that from a lot of people, so I just thought I'd throw that out there as, a, as an interesting example. And I think that in order to do this, at the end of the day, biologists must have tools for thought, largely composed of symbolic computing machinery. It follows that symbolic computing, LISP, or something like it, is the most important scientific tool of our time, and is likely to contribute significantly towards saving the world. That is, of course, if the world wants to be saved. Thank you. So the, um, the briefings in bioinformatics paper covers extremely well the entire the entire literature base of, of list applications in bioinformatics. I would focus um, like if I were to name my, my favorite ones. There's there's a lot of big closure ones that, that have recently been, been coming out. Like for instance, the journal Source Code for Biology and Medicine. There's there's BioCara, which which I mentioned briefly. There's Biosphere. Um, there's a few different ones, but without going into into the names of the various programs, it probably won't hold me much to anyone here, I highly encourage you to look over my paper. Uh, it basically covers the entire the entire ecosystem of, of bioinformatics applications and, and LISP. Um, uh, first, are you familiar with the Dempsey Shaker type theory of patient inference networks? No, tell me about it. Oh, uh, it's just a, it's a, it sounds a little bit like your new application concept, and they have some you, you work with Peter Park, they have some systems that are SRI to do it. Yeah, it sounds familiar. Yeah, I was just going to ask you how, maybe how this new application concept deals with um, non normalizable systems, mm -hmm. because that seems to be the reason that we can't take low level descriptions and yeah. just predict the high level behavior. Yeah, no, for sure. So that was basically uh, in, the, in the same part of my talk, I talked about genotology. So, mm -hmm. Um, obviously, you know, none, of, none of these methods are perfect, and, uh, and I think that ultimately it will be a matter of finding the, the right, the right combination for the right, you know, the right tool for the right job. And I feel personally that if, if uh, so, Peter Carp, you mentioned Peter, so he's been doing some really great work uh, with looking over, looking over networks and cr constructing big uh, network diagrams. He just recently published a paper in BMC Bioinformatics on this. I would encourage you to check it out. Um, I feel that. You know, when you're when you're looking at, at things like this, like when you're looking at gene ontologies, let's say if you're if you're not adding an extra layer of complexity on top of that, we're talking cell type specific, tissue type specific levels of, of pathway information, let's say, um, you're gonna you're gonna inevitably be, be led into 
in, in, into a little bit of a problem. Uh, and, that's, and that's actually becoming more and more felt in the biological community, which is why the Cell Atlas Project has recently undergone uh, uh, an initiative uh, back in October 2016. I encourage you to look at that. Um, the Atlas Project is basically a, it's, it's, it's an effort to try to map basically at a cell type specific level, at a tissue type specific level, um, in humans of course, basically what disease states of cells look like and normal states of cells look like, etc. So this, that's, that's I think, they're, they're, they're moving towards that. But I feel like if they, if they use LISP for, for this, they could make their task a lot easier, right? Because they wouldn't have to try to fit the tool, you know, you know, make the problem fit the tool, more like have the tool fit the problem. And the list is very good with that, right? It doesn't, it doesn't hinder the, the programmer. Again, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, but we all know, you know, this concept very well. And that's, I think, something that, that really needs to be taking, you know, taking a look at very much. So, um, I just had a second question, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I, I have had a hard time finding, like, really good, uh, both contextual and statistical knowledge about some and you may know more about it than you could. Yeah, of course, of course. No, I know the literature very well. Let me uh, let me tell you about it after the thing because it'll sound like I'm endorsing a specific product. <laughs> uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, two kinds of computation. You mentioned numeric computation in the form of uh, differential equations, yeah. and you mentioned uh, symbolic computation. But wouldn't um, probability and statistics be part of any kind of simulation of this kind? such as, you know, some reaction happening with a certain probability and... Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. So, um, especially biophysics is very well known for this, like when you're modeling ion channels, like I have a collaborator, Wolfgang Honor, who has been doing this for well over, well over 30 years, and I guarantee you that that's a very significant component of, of any model, and it should definitely be incorporated. Now, it also depends, I think, very largely on the application that you're talking about. So, uh, like I showed with the yeast, the yeast model, right? They were they were fitting those analytical differential equations and fitting parameters for almost a decade. And you know, these days, I mean, <laughs> that's that's that. Is that really a problem that you want to personally do, or anyone else wants to, you know, spend ten years working on a problem that may or may not pan out? I mean, we all have careers to work on. We all got grants to write, right? So it's uh, it's it's. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And in fact. A lot, of, a lot of my work these days, so I've been making a lot of mathematical models in codon usage. And codon usage, if, if some of you know, is basically the, the underlying mechanism behind how your genes are, are transcribed into proteins, right? The genes, you know, the protein coding portions are composed of codons. Those codons then later become uh, the amino acids and they get, you know, either alternatively spliced or not, and et cetera. So a lot of my work, if you guys have a chance to, to check it out, it's, it's specifically on what you mentioned regarding probability of statistics. So there's a there's a significant component of that in my work, and um, I feel very strongly about that, and, and I feel like that's something that definitely needs to uh, we need to see more of as we as we move forward. Questions? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you're not a fan of the idea of uh, people basing theories on other theories. Yeah, so it's you have to be very critical. You have to be very critical of, of what you read. And just because it's in a high impact journal from a high impact lab, you need to remember that sometimes these papers get published there because you know someone knows the editor and the editor knows someone else and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And sometimes it's very unfortunate, but uh, some real trash gets gets into these high impact journals. And you have to be extremely critical of the work. You need to read the method sections. You need to read the supplementary materials. Um, because if you don't, then and, and you base your base your theories off of off of something like that's not of you know utmost quality, then you're doing a disservice to science. But you know, for the most part, you know, very very good you know researchers from very uh, prestigious labs. You know, obviously, I'm, I'm talking about the minority here, right? I'm, but the majority are very good people, and they publish great work. And those are the cases, you know, that uh, that we're fortunate to have. But then, of course, you know, in certain cases. You know the opposite happens, and I think it's just a matter of being extremely, extremely critical of the literature and uh, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's and looking whether or not this is indeed, you know. Um, yeah. So I think the point you were trying to make is that if we had a formalized presentation of at least the main conceptual structure of a paper, then it would be a lot easier to be critical, and also that would be done in a 
almost automated way, right? Yeah. So I think what you're advocating for is a formalized representation of the thought process that, that underlies the paper and, and from the data to the conclusion. Exactly. That we then compose to the database and compose and everything else that is available. Yes, yeah. yes. Maybe you want to do it because it's just a uh, yeah, it sounded like you were saying that people that were working for 10 years and improving some not to be the case. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I can tell you about that later. I can, I can show you. I can show you. Anything else? Yeah. One question. Can, can you have like um, uh, emergence from data models including to linear programming? Maybe? I'm sorry, what's your question? Um, uh, would, would you have like this data set to work with? Would, would you extract um, emergent features from them and then do linear programming maybe? Yeah. 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 yeah is that something you're interested in? Yeah, no, it's like um, is it usually done in, in this field? It, it's done often, yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, it's more of an older thing. People have been doing that, you know, like in the last decade or so, but uh, I can I can show you what the citations for it's pretty pretty there should be good literature about it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can show you. Okay, thank you again, Norman.